Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So let's start, inshallah, with a quick review, about five minutes to seven minutes, roughly speaking, a recap of the previous sessions that we had. We spoke about the sixth century and the Arabs that lived during that time and how backwards they were. They were obsessed about idol worshiping. To the most part, they didn't have much respect to their family or their neighbors. They committed a lot of filthy actions and they ate a lot of filthy stuff. And above all of that, they were very unjust towards the people and unjust towards the creator. Moving forward, the Arab tribe of Quraysh was different than the rest of the tribes. Why? What makes Quraysh different than the rest of the Arab? That tribe lived in Mecca. And Mecca is a city where it had the Kaaba. The Kaaba was believed to be the house of Allah. And around the Kaaba, the people of Quraysh and the other Arab, they put idols. And these idols were believed, according to them, that they are a source of benefit and protection from harm. And these idols that they put were the middle person between them and the Creator. So if they want something, they go to the idol. Oh, idol, please tell God to cure me. So they used to partner the Creator with the idol. From Quraysh, there's a lady who married a man from Quraysh. This lady was Amina. Amina gave a birth to a beautiful baby. His name was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Afterwards, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi grew and throughout his childhood, right from the get-go, his father dies. So he grows as an orphan. And he moves from home to home. So he grows as an orphan. Then he goes to an, like a, an area where some people call it like a boarding school. He learns how to speak. He learns how to communicate. He, he strengthens himself physically and mentally with the outdoors and all that training that he took. Then he moves back again to his mom. He lives with his mom until he's six years old. Why until six? Because that was the age when she passed away. He was only six. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. Then he moved to his grandpa. His grandpa was Abdul Muttalib. And he lived with him until approximately the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, was eight years old. Then he moved to his uncle. During his youth, he stayed with his uncle for many years. And he was self-motivated. He worked into business and he worked as a shepherd. And he continued to grow and he impressed many people of his character, his maturity, his manhood. Even in his adulthood, he continued to grow. As a child, he was phenomenal. As a youth, he was incredible. As an adult, he was unparalleled. They've never seen something like that before. In his trustworthiness, to his truthfulness, to his gratitude, to his honesty, to his establishment of justice, to, his, to him helping the needy. He was all over the place of helping people. May Allah allow us to see him in the highest place in paradise. Then, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he marries Khadija. Khadija was the greatest woman, hands down, non-negotiable in Mecca. And he was approximately 25 years. He lived with her for many years, a, dec a decade after their beautiful marriage, and after having several children, approximately five or so, at 35 years old, he helps in the rebuilding of the Kaaba. Why did they have to rebuild it? Because there were water floods, and the Kaaba was about to collapse, and he assisted in the rebuilding of the Kaaba. Actually, he didn't just assist in rebuilding a structure, but he assisted in maintaining the bonds of all the tribes. How? The tribes were about to kill one another over rebuilding the Kaaba. There was a special stone called the Black Stone, which was believed to be blessed. And the Arabs were fighting, no, I want to place that Black Stone. No, I want to until they're about to kill one another. So they said the first one who walks in will be the judge. And the one who walked in was Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he resolved the matter with wisdom and he saved lives by the will of Allah. So far, whatever we said of praise to the Prophet, peace be upon him, to the most part, he basically not a prophet yet. He never said, I'm a prophet. He didn't receive any revelation yet until he was 40 years old. At the age of 40 years old, strange things started to happen. He's having true dreams. He has a dream tonight, next day it happens. He has a dream the next night, the next day it happens. He has a dream the third night, the next day it happens. Identical, strange. Then he starts to hear greetings. Hello. Not any hello, any greeting. It says, oh, peace be upon you, O messenger of the creator. What is this? It's coming from a rock and a tree. Then he has love to be secluded. I want to be alone a little bit. To get to worship the creator, to get to ponder over the purpose of the creation, all that effort. And at the age of 40, brothers and sisters, all of a sudden, while he was in the cave, 
Someone walked in in the dark night after sunset in Ramadan on a Monday. Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic or Arabic calendar. And that man came and he overpowered the Prophet. Muhammad, peace be upon him, was strong, but he couldn't break through. And then this man told him, read. And he says, I cannot read. You know, I can't read. And I'm, I'm unlettered. But he kept saying, read, read, until that person said, read in the name of your Lord. With the assistance of your Lord, you, you will be a well-read, educated person. Then that person told him, your Lord is the one who created you from a blood clot like from a leech like from your embryo that stage and just like how you were a small tiny piece in the womb of your mom and look at you today i will be able to the creator to make you a well-read educated person overnight allahu akbar but prophet muhammad is worried is concerned he thought he's possessed he thought he's about to lose it he thought that's it i'm gonna die anytime soon what's going on so he goes to his wife she calms him down she told him, never will the creator ever want to harm someone who does the good that you do. Look at her intelligence. The creator will never harm someone that does the good that you do. You never associate anyone with the creator. You never worshipped idols. You helped the poor. You helped the needy. You were the best family man ever Mecca has witnessed. You're someone who's always hospitable to the guests. And you lift oppression whenever you're able to. God will never do something like that to you. Let's go to my cousin, Waraka. They go to her cousin, Waraka, who was a scholar at that time of religion, who was able to read and to write. So he heard the story of the cave and what happened and the man squeezing Muhammad. And he says, what happened to you is what happens to previous prophets. You just have been revealed to, you are a prophet of God. And by the way, whoever comes with the message from the God, which is the truth, the message, he will be sought to expel him. So people will try to ruin that individual. So watch out. The prophet kind of interrupted him. Expel me, like, not out of arrogance or pride, like, I get expelled, Muhammad, you know, very loved by the people. Yes, because of the message that you have. And then, brothers and sisters, that's where we stopped the, the past three sessions on, what was the date? Forgot, September something. You know the date, Maria? Oh, mashallah, September 20. Mashallah, how old are you, Maria? Mashallah, may Allah protect you and bless you. Eight years old. May Allah protect you and make you the coolness of the eyes of your parents. Say, I mean, excellent. So that's where we kind of stopped. And then, brothers and sisters, the revelation stopped. And it, the prophet was very sad. What's next? Okay, what is this all about? Okay, I kind of got a feel that there's something very special about this, but I still, it's not completely clear yet. What's the message? In addition to the pause of revelation, guess what happens? Waraka, the scholar, within a matter of days or so, he passes away without a doubt. That adds more sadness to it, yes or no? Then the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is waiting and waiting and waiting and no further revelation. What is going on? All of a sudden, as he was walking, he hears sound. What is this? Looks to his right, there's nobody. He hears sound, someone saying something. Looks to his left, nobody. Looks to the front, nobody. Looks to the back, nobody. Then he notices the sound is coming from up in the sky. So he looks up. And who does he see? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sees the angel whom he saw in the cave. And that angel was sitting on the chair between the sky and the earth. Muhammad, peace be upon him, he saw that. He got nervous. He fell on the ground. Then he stood up and he ran to his wife Khadija. He went to his wife. He, says, cover, he said, cover me, cover me, cover me. Cover me, cover me, cover me. And then she covered him. And he comf comforted himself. And she helped him out. But this time it's different. This time that angel will go to the prophet. Peace be upon him. And he comes to him and then he reveals verses. Now Khadija and whoever would be around at that time cannot see what the prophet is seeing. But they can see the effects of revelation. What do I mean with that? When the prophet typically receives revelation, he sweats so much as if he ran a marathon. He sweats and he sweats, even though he's sitting on his bed. Not just that, the color of his face changes. So they get to see all that change, but they never get to see what he's seeing. Then the revelation stops and goes away. Brother, can you please tell us what was revealed to him? Hold on. Because that angel, when he leaves, it was a very short period till he comes again. So revelation after revelation after revelation after revelation. Okay, can you tell us what was revealed? Here is the, not the problem, is the time constraint that we have. So what I would like to do 
And we'll go just a little bit, inshallah, technical, just a tiny bit, very simple, inshallah. But I'll do my best to make it clear for all of us. Fair enough? What I will do, inshallah, do I have your undivided attention? I will try to provide you with a summary. A summary of what the foundational message of Islam is. It's like Islam 101 to an extent at the beginning of time. Summarizing, summarizing it with few points, inshallah. May Allah bless our time. Ameen. So first of all, the creator is telling Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, there's a system, there's a religion. I want your actions to be in its accordance. What's that religion? Islam. Islam will provide you a road map to life. So this road is the road of Islam. These side roads, O Muhammad and O believers, is the wrong path. Wrong way and the right way. So what is Islam all about? The Prophet, peace be upon him, he teaches us that number one, first and foremost, Islam is about complete submission to the creator of the heavens and the earth. Complete obedience. The creator tells Muhammad that when you submit to me, your life will no longer be the same. Absolute greatness upon greatness in this life and the afterlife. Not just that, when you trust me and obey me, I will take care of your affairs and we'll comment on that more. What else is Islam all about? Islam, brothers and sisters, is not about the worship of others. That's the wrong way. It's about keeping family ties. And Islam stresses so significantly on family. Family, family, family. I pray to Allah to have our family bonds stronger than ever. Say, I mean, that's what Islam promotes. And then Islam says, don't you ever break the family ties. Islam is all about truth and not lies. Islam is about trust and not betrayal. Islam, brothers and sisters, is about humility and not arrogance. It's about modesty and not shamelessness. It's about justice and not oppression. It's about gratitude and not ungratefulness and much, much more. Okay? Don't you ever cross the boundaries. That's what you have to remember. What determines modesty? It's a big, big, big range, but don't cross the limits. Who decides? The creator decides, which makes a lot of sense. The one who made you tells you what you're supposed to be doing, and he puts the limits for you. Anything else that can assist us? Can I ask you a question? What is it? Does Islam accommodate my cultural practices? Yes, it does. It does. Cultural practices, yes, is encompassed within Islam as long as what? It does not cross the boundaries. So, for example, if in your culture, as a simple example, waving to your parents, hi, is a sign of respect, to your family, then go ahead. In Islam includes the waving to your parents. If waving to your parents was an insult, was a complete disrespect, it's like you declaring war on them, then don't do it because they'll be outside. They'll be breaking the ties of family. So yes, takes into culture. For example, a woman came to me. She's from India. She said, Brother Majid, in our situation, when we greet our mom, we go in complete prostration my forehead on the ground. She's from India, that's her culture. Is that okay? What do we say now? In this case, no, it's not. Because in Islam, prostration is a complete act of worship and it's only to Allah. So your prostration goes outside the boundaries. But you know what, sister? Let me tell you how far you can go in Islam. You can go as low as her feet, but not under. You can go and kiss her feet, but don't go all the way down with your forehead on the floor. You see what Islam does? Not just that, Islam also encourages accurate scientific research. That's what Allah is teaching the Prophet, peace be upon him, which part of that meaning is when the Allah says in the Quran and ask the people of knowledge. For example, Islam does not specifically talk about heavy doses of whatever drugs that can kill people, the extreme examples, okay? The non-negotiable examples. So Islam doesn't really talk about this, but Islam says that your body is what? Say it. Say it. It's a trust. Your body is a trust. So, but Islam doesn't say about that heavy dosage of drugs that kills you. It doesn't talk about it. So we need our fellow scientists, researchers, people understanding to tell us what is this product. And then once they tell us, if it's, let's say, harmful, then it becomes the wrong way. And so on and so forth. May Allah protect us. By the way, FYI. Never, and remember this sentence, never, ever, ever will a pure, accurate, scientific research ever cross the boundaries. Meaning, it will never contradict religion. Why? 
Because the creator of the human beings is the same creator of the laws of the universe. Are you guys with me? And it will never contradict me. Allah protect us. Amin Rabbil Alameen. So this was a quick summary. And then proceed, brothers and sisters, in these revelations, Allah, He tells the Prophet something. Ready for this? What are these red dots? These red dots, brothers and sisters, are means of you to fall into these wrong ways. Who are these red dots? Warn us, tell us. Allah teaches you something. Allah is teaching the Prophet to go convey to all of us. What is it? That there are devils on these dots trying to seduce you, trying to make you feel insecure. Come here, come here. Yeah, yeah, that's modesty. Trust me, it's modesty. Then until they push you where? To shamelessness. May Allah protect us. By the way, brother, I'm sorry. What do you mean devils? Like, what do you mean? They're jinn. Okay, didn't help. Okay, jinn have free will. It's a different creation, not human beings. Okay? They can see you, but you cannot see them. Okay, are they here? What's going on? They might be here. Allahu alam. Amongst the jinn, are good people and bad people, just like you and I. Human beings are good and bad. But the ones here are the evil jinn. They're very, very, very influential. Okay, and what's the way to rescue? As influential as they are, as easy as it is, it is to destroy them. Anybody can help me. What can we do to destroy the devils? What, is Allah, what did Allah reveal to the Prophet? Go ahead. May Allah protect us. Say, I mean, she says that Allah says, for you to be able to destroy all these devils trying to call you, come here, come here, is by saying one statement. A'udhu billahi min shaytan Oh Allah, I seek, I seek your refuge from the devil. So far, so good. I can hook you up with a narration, just one lesson that we can take. Chapter number 2, verses, or verse 255. It's called Ayatul Kursi. You read that verse at night, all these devils are gone till the day, inshallah. You read that verse in the morning, all the devils are gone until that night. It's like shifts. So don't ever forget to read every morning, chapter 2, verse 255. And every night, may Allah allow us all to remember that. Say, I mean. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that revelation, and these are like verses after verses after verses, what happens? He gives a summary. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'm summarizing, those who submit to the Creator in this life, and in the afterlife, there's a consequence to that. In this life, he promises richness in the heart. What do we mean? That's pretty fancy. The Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, whoever the afterlife is their main target, seeking God's pleasure is their main target, worshipping Allah is the main target, then the God promises that he will make you rich in your heart. What does it mean? No matter how poor you may be from the outside, you'll always be content. Allahu Akbar. You might have empty pockets, nothing, but the richness is in the heart. You try, but Allah will always grant you contentment. May Allah grant it to all of you and peace in the heart. Wallahi, people pay billions and billions of dollars and you will never be able to achieve it. There's one and only one. And look at the confidence. How come you're so confident like that? Because the creator, the one who made you, manufactured you, told you in the manual that the only way, man amila salihan, min dhakrin aw untha, if you do righteous deeds, okay, that means all of us should. No, 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 we have to be honest. If you do righteous deeds while you're a believer in the Creator, then the Creator promised, فَلَا نُحِيَنَّوْ حَيَاةً طَيِّبًا I promise you the good life. Other people, they can do all the songs they want about the good life. The rapping and all that stuff. You know what we, perhaps some of us are referring to. May Allah grant you all the good life. Say, I mean. So Allah says, promises riches in the heart as an individual and as a community level, greatest of civilizations. Promise, you work as a group, you do your best, we'll give you the greatest of civilizations. So what is the creators teaching us here? That many people believe that when you connect religion with your life, that makes your life not progress, yes or no? It makes it as an obstacle, you'll always be backwards. No, God is saying you practice the faith, you will have the greatest of civilizations. Be like, but many people practice the faith. Okay, help me out. What did we just say right here? What was that yellow part? It's only one way. It's not say all oh, the roads leads to Rome or whatever in the world they say. No, there's only one road to that, which is Islam, may Allah make us all submit to the Creator. So that's in this life. In the afterlife, the Creator promises absolute happiness. 
Absolute happiness. You go to paradise. I'll share with you four qualities. You go to paradise, you'll always be young and never get old. I know the elders, they love that part, right? Thank you for saying that, right? May Allah bless you all. Say, I mean, you'll always be young and never get old. Number two, you'll always be healthy and never get sick. Number three, you'll always be happy and you will never be sad. Number four, you'll always be alive and never fear death. So you can drive as fast as you want in Jannah. Don't worry, no accidents, inshallah. All right? May Allah protect us. As for those who are arrogant, as for those who rejected the truth after it was clearly presented to them, you reject it? No, nope, I'm not worshiping the Creator, whatever in the world you're referring to. I don't worship anything. No, 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 no. Don't say that. There's something that you worship. I don't worship. I'm not a religious person. No, but you, you do worship something. What is it, the thing that you're willing to sacrifice the whole world for? Sacrifice everything for something? I have nothing to sacrifice. Sacrifice everything for something? No way. I don't give up my life for anyone. Okay, then you worship yourself. Simple. That's it. You worship yourself. You worship your desires. You don't ever tell me what's right and what's wrong. Don't you ever put me in boundaries? I like to live in a free world. But what, what, to who decides how far? Who decides the right and the wrong? Who puts the boundaries? Yes, the people can put boundaries. No problem. No problem. But as long as within the boundaries that the Creator has put for us, may Allah protect us all. So if they're arrogant and they reject, this is what Islam is. And we're not going to cover stuff or sugarcoat things because this is a trust, emptiness and misery. Some may say, I don't know why you say that. It's, you seem very confident. It's getting a bit cocky here. No, it's not. That's what the revelation, that's what Islam is all about. You do not submit to the Creator. Or let me give it, make it even simpler for you. The Allah, He says, That's what He says. He says, whoever is away from the path. Remember the path in the picture? Remember that? Remember the path? He says, whoever deviates away from the path will have a miserable life. So the further you're away from the path, the more miserable your life is. And wallahi, if you're honest with yourself and you explore the world around you, you flip through TV channels, you will hear people saying that. And not any people. The celebrities and the famous and the rich, the ones who have what you're dying to have. Yes or no? The ones who have what you're dying to have. They reach the top and they're yelling down. Like, hey, that, wrong way, bro. I'm not feeling what you're dying for. Happiness ain't in this road. These are the side roads. They're doing everything possible. I just watched an interview this week by one of the top comedians. It's on YouTube. He says and he explains to the interviewer whose net worth is in the millions. And he says, you know when like uh, you drive sometimes and it really hits you hard when you're like alone and you're not busy? And the emptiness, that's what he says, the emptiness in the heart. And you start crying like, meh, meh, meh. He, then the guy says, I know exactly what you're talking about. Allahu Akbar. Wallahi, you watch this and you say, La ilaha illallah, no deity worthy of worship but Allah. And it's not just him. And he says clearly, he says, that's why we go to our phones. Because we don't want to face the fact when we're alone. Because when we are alone, we think, what is this life is all about? And we realize, like, what did I spend all my life doing? Like, what is, what's next? What's happening? Why am I here? All that confusion. Just like that guy who came to do my internet. He came to fix the outlet. So I thought of opening up the topic. Wishing the best for him. Because the Prophet, peace be upon him, was not sent except as mercy to mankind, yes or no, to the whole world. As the wonderful, uh, our brother and sister who drew this for us, may God grant him Jannah, nice calligraphy, which represents the verse, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ O Muhammad, we did not send you except mercy to all beings. So we tried, we tried, so I opened up the topic. Somehow we came to the question, brother, what's the purpose of life? He's, he's like, listen, man, as long as I'm busy, <laughs> I don't care. You know what we say? La ilaha illallah. Because him saying that shows that it came and it crossed his mind. It shows that he does not want to ever be free. I kid you not, I'll end on this one. There's a lot that can be spoken about. And another person who's so famous, one of the Muslim speakers, he came and he was invited to a high-end dinner. So he said, I don't know what to talk about, celebrities and big shots. He said, I met people there. Some of the comedians and celebrities were amongst the most famous ones in the area. So he said, I went, like, what should I put together about Islam? 
So he said, all what came to my mind was to give a talk about happiness and about misery and what makes you happy and not. All referencing the Quran and the authentic tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He swears by God, and this was in the public, this was seen by others. As he was speaking, one of the top people in the media world, he fell on his knees, got so emotional, started to cry, and he told them, oh Imam, you're saying the truth. Oh Imam, you're saying the truth, I'm the among the most miserable people on earth. And he explains, he interrupts the talk, it's a high-end dinner celebrities and so on. He said, let me tell you what this imam is saying about not about the truth as much as about the emptiness. Are you guys with me? He says, I'm someone all you guys know. I would to head to the studio to record a live, not record, to provide a live session on stage. He says, while I'm at home, I'm miserable. I'm crying. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to put it in words. He says that I drive to the studio and I'm crying and crying and crying. I arrive to the studio and I'm crying and I'm crying and I'm crying. I go to the makeup room so they can adjust it because of the lights. Then the makeup artist tells me, stop the tears, you're ruining the makeup. So he says, I hold myself and I hold myself. Then I come on stage and before the curtains are about to open so I can present my segment, I'm about to cry but I hold it. Then they open the curtains and I fake smile and make the whole world laugh, and only if they knew that I'm crying from the inside. This is an emptiness that I pray to Allah that you and I get it to have filled for us, and get it to help fill other people's hearts. Say Ameen. And this is what the whole series is about. It's not just entertainment and so on. Yes, we'll have fun. Yes, we will laugh. Yes, but we also want to learn and take some life lessons that we can establish for the rest of our lives. May Allah grant you all happiness in this life and the afterlife. As for the afterlife, for those who are arrogant, if what they saw in this world is emptiness and misery, the afterlife, severe punishment, as the Creator has decided, may Allah protect us. Amir Rabbil Alameen. Advice for all of us. Don't throw judgments on people. Your friend Ahmed, John, your friend Yusuf, David, whatever, Jessica, Khadija, whatever her name is, whatever his name is in your lifetime. Do not go around to the graveyard. She's going to hell. She's going to Jannah. She's going to hell. And he, oh, he's going to Jannah. Trust me, bro. I'm, what do you mean trust you? How do you know? How did you know? Well, may Allah protect us. Sounds good? Because you might get in trouble. May Allah guide you all. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. Especially, especially the emphasis, obviously, among those who say, La ilaha illallah. May Allah make your last words, La ilaha illallah. Done. <sighs> good? Okay? So far, it's okay bit technical but it's okay summarize many of the chapters and the verses that were revealed as in simple way may Allah accept from all of us all right brothers and sisters now the Prophet is on a mission he got that revelation and what's his job go and convey and tell the people about this give warnings and give glad tidings so he's gonna go I have a question feel free to raise your hand I appreciate if you can contribute what proof did the Prophet have that he's a prophet like, what are the proofs of his prophethood so far? Based on what you heard. Anybody can help? Give it a shot. Don't, Bismillah, go for it. What does he have? What is it? Wonderful. So one of the things the sister is saying is that his ability to see things other people cannot see. In a way, that is correct to an extent, but we would reward a bit. But I will keep that. I will save it. Excellent. Anything else? Go ahead. Wonderful. So the brother to him... The brother to him right here, he says one of the big proofs he has is his message. That's what the brother is saying. You guys agree? His message seems powerful. Okay, I would need, some of you like, I'm sufficient. I'm actually good with this. Whatever you just said is pretty, kind of hit me hard. I, I'm good. I'm actually want to go home, cry I'm, for a good reason, right? Want to repent, change your way of life. That's fantastic. Some people are like, I want more. Give me more. It's fine. It's okay. Keep going. Revelation came in phases and steps. May Allah guide you all. Say, I mean. Any other thing? Any other proof of his prophethood? Any last one? Go for it. But you have to say out loud. Go all the way back. Yeah. What is it? Ahsan? Go ahead. Seal of prophethood. Excellent. That's the point. We'll touch on it, inshallah. Okay, go ahead. Yes, you. Yes. What is it? Okay, so he believes, so he practiced much of what has been revealed, right? Before even receiving revelation. 
Brothers and sisters, the Prophet Sallallahu appetizer of proofs is the main dish, the first dish, the first one. It's the door. That's the biggest of proofs. Is what? It's his resume, his character. Yes or no? His character is unparalleled. You're like, bro, I've never seen anyone like, anything like this this year. No, 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 no. Expand it. I've never seen anything like this in this decade. No, no, expand it more. There's nothing like him. Unbelievable. You know what I just read recently about an article about Messi and Ronaldo, right? It's a unanimous thing that we agree that they're good players. May Allah protect us. If you don't know who they are, I actually would like to know what's your name. Inshallah, tabarakallah. I'm very proud of you that you don't waste your time, right, with soccer or football. So they say if you live during an era where you see Messi and Ronaldo playing live, then you are a blessed human being. They say that they are a, foot, a, a, a once in a lifetime football genius. So what does it mean? You will live 60 plus years and the chances of you seeing someone at the caliber of Messi and Ronaldo is once. Okay. Muhammad the better example. Not lifetime, not century, not millennium. Throughout the history of humanity, no one was like him. No one, no one was as truthful as him. No one was as trustworthy. It's just remarkable. Who is of that caliber? Unanimous, the entire city, unanimous. Not one, except they say he is the trustworthy. They don't, by the way, Muhammad is not called by his first name. Do you guys know that? He's not called, like, he's like, oh, hey, Muhammad. So I said, no, they call him, oh, the most truthful just walked in. The trustworthy just passed by. That was his attitude. Not once from childhood to 40 plus years old, not once did he fabricate a statement. This is not normal. Like, yeah, that's normal. You are an amazing person if you think that's normal. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Maybe not about the fabrication, but how, about how, how is it that he was very hospitable to a high level? You might have it all. May Allah grant it to all of you. Say, I mean. But I'm saying not just having it, but at that level of having it. He was not a rich man, but he kept donating right and left. He didn't have all the food in the world or a house that is so massive, yet he always had the door open for guests to come. Unbelievable. So his character is the opening of proofs. The second thing is, as a brother mentioned, is the message. The message, the so powerful, which you heard, and much, much more. But there's an element to it that, I'll be honest with you, much of us in the West or in America or whatever in the part of the world, or to be more specific, the ones that don't know the language of Arabi may not really appreciate that miracle of the Quran. The language in which what's, it was said was unbelievable. And you will see that shortly. May Allah protect you all and grant you Jannah. Say Ameen. Okay, move on, brother. What's going to happen next? Is he going to set up like a table and call people? Say, La ilaha illallah, no deity worthy of worship but Allah, and you will be successful. Did he just go say that just like that? No, not yet. You forgot who his people were. He's coming to preach. There's only one creator. And you know that all his people, to the most part, their social, economic, whole structure is based on idols. That's how they make their income. That's how they get their prestige. So you go and want to change that, you're, you're in trouble. Think of a place in the world that their only source of income is oil. Then you cut that off. What they will do with you? Yeah. May Allah protect us. Say, I mean... Someone only, how many people, how many people they know it's wrong, but they still continue. How many people in the world, how many governments in the world, they know tobacco is killing their youth. Yes or no? It's killing their people. Yes or no? Yet they keep selling it. Why? You know, as an example, I don't know if it's true or not, as an example that, you know, the billions of tax dollars that we get from it. So you know, so you're not about science anymore after all, because your science is killing people. And you tell your child, don't you ever smoke, but let's just make sure it's okay for people to buy. What a shame. Yes or no? What a shame. May Allah protect us. See, I mean. So brothers and sisters, he will go privately and selectively. And as I'm talking, I want you to think, would he come to you had you been alive then? So who will he go to? He will go and start with the people of the greatest character. Focus with me. May Allah bless you. People with the highest of character that naturally their life is similar to what Islam says. Are you guys with me on this one? So just like the Prophet, peace be upon him, his lifestyle was pretty much a Muslim. Did you ever see someone like that at work? Like, brother, wallah, this guy here, wallah, he is such a Muslim, but he does not know about it. You see what you're feeling? I feel you. 
oh, this girl, yes, it's true, she's not wearing hijab and whatever it is. Yes, she doesn't pray. Yes, she doesn't believe in God. But let me finish. The way she behaves, wallah, she's like the best Muslim in the world. Fantastic. Fantastic. That means that the Prophet, he says, or get ready for this. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, the best people pre-Islam are the best people after, after Islam, if they just polish a few things. That's what he said. If you were the best one in the company of most truthful, most dedicated, most hardworking, most honest, most giving, in Islam, if you accept it, you will be the greatest Muslim. But just polish a few things. Set up the boundaries a little bit. Maybe you thought, oh, I thought that was okay. Oh, it's not. Oh, oh my, I'm, I'm going to work on it. Right? Just to polish a few things. May Allah protect you all. See, I mean, in the eyes of the Prophet, who was the greatest of people of character? It was none other than his wife, Khadija, radiallahu anha. Khadija. And how amazing is that, that he starts with his wife. She was the greatest. Without any introduction, he speaks to her and she says, I bear witness that Allah, the Creator, is the only one worthy of worship and you, my husband, Muhammad, is his slave and messenger. No introduction. Why? She's logical. I lived with him so far for 15 years. I see nothing but greatness from this man in my life. May Allah allow our, hus uh, our wives and the people who have their husbands, may Allah grant them that level where they praise them and they're happy with their life. Say, I mean, right? I imagine the prophet said, hey, I'm, God chose me to be the prophet. She's like, I believe you. What some people will do today? A guy comes to his house. Guess what, babe? I got the best employee of the month. <laughs> I wish you were the best husband of the month. <laughs> best employee? Okay, good for you. You fake, double-faced, right? The best employee and the most ridiculous husband of the month. Right? The prophet, the best of examples. He was the best in the house, the best outside the house. You know what was the first thing he did when he walked into his house? The first thing he did when he walked to his house. The first thing. He, he walked, ready to do this, inshallah? The first thing he did once he walked to his house was what? What many of us do, the first thing when we leave our house. He used to brush his teeth. Yeah, wow, yeah, I feel you, right? It's beautiful. Because he's going to communicate with his wife and his children. So the first thing I do once I come back home, I'm going to brush my teeth. Siwak, Allahu Akbar. See the greatest of men. May Allah protect us. Say Amin. So he goes to his wife Khadija and with logic, yes, absolutely, I will take what you say. May Allah grant us Jannah and paradise. Say Amin. Amin Rabbil Alameen. Next, brothers and sisters, he goes to his cousin Ali bin Abi Talib. Brother, how old was Ali at that time? He was 10 years old. But he was not any, like any 10-year-old. He was special. He was awesome. He was unique. He was of the greatest of youth. May Allah protect us and allow us to see him in paradise. Say Amin. He speaks to Ali. How old was Ali? About 10 years old. Ali, I'm this, I'm that. Whatever he says, then Ali says, you know what? I bear witness, no deity of worship, but Allah, and you are his prophet. Allahu Akbar. You know how amazing that is? Ali, his cousin. Then the prophet goes to his best friend, best friend ever. He was about two years younger than him. His best friend was so similar to him. One of great character, helpful, hospitable, helps the needy, great with his family. And you know what you appreciate here is how his best friend was someone of good character. Someone of what? It's okay to have a friend whose favorite color is pink. It's okay. And yours is blue. It's fine. You can have differences. It's okay if your best friend's favorite car is a Lamborghini and yours is a Toyota. It's okay. You'll always be friends. But it's not okay for your best friend to be an evildoer full of, full of horrible, miserable character. And you just are okay with it to hang out 24-7 with him or her. Yes or no? So he was okay to be different with Abu Bakr and what the food he likes to eat and where he wants to hang out. But I cannot be okay with him being different in terms of great character. So he goes to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the best of friends. He tells him, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq doesn't have any more discussion yet with him. And to him, he was full of conviction. How is your conviction so far? If you were there, would he come to you? Or like, oh, no way, not them, no way. Or like, you know what? Yeah, I would come to them. It's okay. If you feel not... There's still room, inshallah, may Allah bless our lives. Say ameen. So he goes and he speaks to the people. Abu Bakr Siddiq, he realized, listen, this message is not the responsibility of the Prophet. It's the responsibility for every believer. So he wants now to go convey the message. What's the proof of Abu Bakr that the message is true? 
the message he has and the character of Abu Bakr and the character of the Prophet. So he goes and he talks to who? The people of the greatest of character. Check Abu Bakr out right here. Abu Bakr, right then and there, he talks to Uthman bin Affan, a multi-millionaire. How old is he? Approximately 34 years old. He tells him about Islam. He accepts Islam. Abu Bakr goes to Abdul Rahman bin Auf, a multi-millionaire, tells him about Islam, someone of great character. May Allah grant you righteousness associated with a lots of money if that part was good for you. I mean, Abdul Rahman bin Auf, about 30 years old. Then he goes to Sa'ib bin Abi Waqqas, talks him about Islam. He accepts it. How old was he? About 17 years old. He goes to Talha ibn Ubaidillah, speaks him about Islam. Talha says, I bear witness that the, the creator is Allah. No one worthy of worship but him. And Muhammad is a slave and messenger. How old? 13 years old. He goes to Zubayr ibn al-Awwam, talks to him. How old was he? About 12 years old. You see, the young blood, you see, from old, from 55 years old, Khadija, all the way to, not that Zubair, to Ali bin Abi Talib. And it goes on and on and on, brothers and sisters, all of a sudden, what happens? Revelation comes. What's the matter? New revelation comes, but this revelation will change everything. The Prophet been conveying privately and selectively for about three years now. How many Muslims, how many? About 40, some people estimate 40 roughly. Some go as far as 200, that's the range. Brother, three years. Yeah, but they might be 40, but they're not any 40. Yes or no? May Allah bless you all, say Ameen. And may Allah make us with those 40 who remain to be steadfast. What's the revelation, brothers and sisters? Allah reveals, the angel comes and he reveals, your creator says to you, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Now, warn all people, go public. No more hiding, no more private, no more selective. Whatever word you want, go public and warn everybody. Is the prophet going to put his life on the line and go talk to people? Will he do that? Is he going to submit? Is he? And now is he going to walk the talk? We have to submit to the creator at all expense. We'll see, inshallah. Let's take a short break. About 10 minutes, inshallah. Then we will resume afterwards for a very, very important session. May Allah bless you. Jazakumullah khair.